Hello and welcome to a little chat about comfort reads in trying times, whether it be during Corona lockdown in January or in other times of loss or transition when you feel that you don't necessarily need very demanding books, but books that you can simply immerse yourself in. I've picked six books, six novels from my own shelves that I would recommend without hesitation. I'll get to them in a minute. I've always been a reader. I've gone through many different authors, different genres and types of books over the years. Probably you have too if you're a reader, which I assume you are since you're watching this video. Many readers I think choose their next book based on how they feel. What do I feel like reading now? What kind of world do I want to inhabit? What sort of language do I want to read? What kind of characters do I want to meet? Different books for different moods, different seasons maybe, different life circumstances. Sometimes you're ready to be uh, met with new challenges in a book, but at other times you want to read what is already familiar, an author that is already familiar, maybe even a book that is already familiar. The stories we need at certain times reflect who we are, I think, at that point in time, or um, where we're at in our lives. Sometimes we simply want a book to keep us company. At other times we're ready for more demanding books, but sometimes we need books as a kind of self-medication, as a way of nurturing ourselves uh, in certain or uncertain times. Different remedies for different ailments. It's the notion of bibliotherapy, which broadly means using literature or books as a way of helping us through uh, certain psychological problems or emotional problems we're experiencing or helping us uh, cope with certain experiences or changes we're going through, or perhaps even helping us grow as human beings. Sometimes though, life can be overwhelming. And in those moments, we may simply need to escape for a little while to recharge our batteries. That's where more escapist literature comes in. And that's what this video is partly about. Because I think we can all agree that these are trying times for some more than others, obviously. For me, this has meant that I've uh, chosen books that take me out of myself. I felt a distinct need to inhabit worlds that were uh, unlike my own, which means the books I've picked are what I would call immersive. They're also longer than the books I typically read. Reading longer books means spending more time in those worlds, but also you don't have to make a new choice about a new book to read for quite a while. You can just relax and be in that universe with that author for a while. You can inhabit it. So book number one I would choose as a comfort read these days is The Talented Miss Ripley by Patricia Highsmith. This fantastic novel might not be exactly what you would consider comforting, but that's not quite what I mean by comfort reads anyway. It's incredibly clever, it's entertaining, and it's also quite outlandish, actually. Maybe you've seen the movie with Matt Damon and Jude Law and Gwyneth Paltrow. It's excellent and it's what drew me to the book in the first place, but of course the book is even better. I don't want to spoil too much, but let me just say that murder is involved and a captivating narrator that draws you in even if you don't want to. Highsmith keeps the reader on edge throughout the book, but it's belittling of the book to say that it's merely a psychological thriller, I think. It's so much more. Um, it's about social manipulation for one thing, and it's about identity. Also, you get to travel to Manhattan, to the south of France, to Italy, while sipping a few martinis along the way, apropos. The next book is Rebecca. Excuse the tacky cover, it does not do the book justice. The first line of Rebecca is iconic. Last night I dreamt I went to Manderley again. And it sets the mood and the tone for this um, part gothic, very atmospheric novel. Again, the attraction, like the first book, is for me in the narration. To what extent can we trust the narrator? To what extent can she trust the people that she meets? Uh, she's actually never named. Another attraction of the book is the atmosphere. Uh, the author, Daphne du Maurier, was really amazing at capturing this foreboding, sinister atmosphere. Many of her books took place in the southwest of England, in Cornwall, and that's where this one takes place as well. At the same time, she set a brisk storytelling pace. 
She was known as one of those writers who can write books that are both literary and bestsellers, which indeed characterizes all the books that I've chosen to mention today. All this, by the way, also applies to My Cousin Rachel by Daphne du Maurier, which I've just read in about three days. So if you already read Rebecca, you could give this one a shot. And by the way, Rebecca was made into a movie by Alfred Hitchcock, which tells you all about both the quality and the atmosphere. I'm sorry, but the new version is not quite as good. The next book is The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. It's a classic, of course, and you may already know it, but have you read it? I have to say it's one of the longest books that I've ever read. This version is 1065 pages long, and it does take quite a while. It requires some patience, but it delivers in spades. It's the ultimate tale of suffering and retribution, and it's based on uh, a real story about a wrongful imprisonment. Uh, the main character is framed by some people and is imprisoned on the Isle of If in the Mediterranean. And at one point he discovers or hears rumors about a hidden treasure on the island of Monte Cristo. And um, he begins to plan an escape, etc. I don't want to spoil too much, but as I've seen a reviewer say about it, they don't write books like this anymore. For my particular version, it was sort of interesting to note that every night when I had sort of finished reading it, I would have gold on my fingertips, which interestingly brings me to the next book. The next book is The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco. This is an old Danish copy. And here too, I saw the movie first, but it uh, turned out to be a really good appetizer. It's medieval murder mystery, philosophy and Gothic noir all rolled into one set in a monastery in the Italian countryside and has a host of uh, spooky and dubious monks. The main character is William of Baskerville, who functions as a kind of Sherlock Holmes here, and he has a sidekick called Adso, who is a kind of Dr. Watson. The story, too, unfolds really gradually and slowly, but also very atmospherically, and again, I think it delivers in spades. It being Echo, there's a fair share of Latin quotes and church politics and history, but it fits the book in my opinion. It does no harm when you become smarter by reading a book. And it's a book about books, and it's a book about secrets and silence and heresy. Book number five is Emma by, of course, Jane Austen. I haven't really loved any of the film adaptations of Emma, which is one of the reasons why I want to recommend it. And another reason is that if you've read one book by Jane Austen, uh, it's usually Pride and Prejudice. And if you haven't read anything by Jane Austen, why not? Austen is partly adored by those who read her and partly underestimated by those who haven't. Um, part of the reason why some people haven't read her is that they judge her based on the movies. And many of the movies are good, but the movies are all about empire dresses and plot and carriages, etc. Whereas Austen wrote spectacular prose and dealt in irony. They both deal in satire, of course. The best film adaptation, by the way, to me, is Sense and Sensibility, for which Emma Thompson wrote the screenplay and Ang Lee directed. Anyway, in Emma, there's a lot of love complications as usual, but there's also a heroine who really thinks she's on top of things, but in fact, she's deluding herself. And there's a lot of humor. Jane Austen herself thought that Emma would be the kind of heroine that nobody else apart from herself would like, but of course she was wrong. Um, one of the reasons that she felt that is because Emma is smug and a snob, but of course she develops throughout the novel. One thing that makes this novel stand out among Austen's novels is that there comes a point in the reading of it where you're compelled to reassess everything you've just read, alongside with Emma, who's also compelled to reassess everything. This is the mark, to me, of a master storyteller. And apropos masterly storytelling, the last book is The Crimson Petal and the White by Michelle Faber. This is simply a gorgeous, sumptuous, wonderful book with characters that are slowly and atmospherically revealed. Um, and it takes place in Victorian London with all its seediness and horse carriages and smells and everything. The book is part entertaining romp, part social commentary, part love story, part tragedy. Um, and the author spent some 10 years researching and writing it. 
Here's the first line, which I just, or first couple of lines, which I just love. Watch your step, keep your wits about you. You will need them. So again here, you've got this very interesting narrator. In this book, partly an intrusive narrator, but it makes it really interesting and immersive. And it's just a hugely satisfying book to read. I envy anybody who hasn't read this yet. So these were my six recommendations. Um, despite the length of some of them, I wouldn't hesitate to reread them. If you've got suggestions for comfort reads during trying times or any times, I would love to hear them. Thank you so much for watching.